you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 20, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Genesis chapter 20, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what, have, and what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, Why sawest thou uh, when thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou wilt shew unto me at every, at every place whither ye shall come, <coughs> say of me, He is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen, and men servants, and women servants, and gave them to Abraham, and restored, and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given my brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes, and to all that are with thee and with all others, thus was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the place that you've given us to meet, Lord. We thank you and praise you for from time to time that you make your word, your word <coughs> a living word to us. We praise you for that. God, we pray, we praise you for each and every one that is here this morning. Uh, we know here, we know by your word they're here by divine appointment. And nothing accident or coincidence, a coincidence happens under your care. God, we pray this morning that you would honor your word with the person of the Holy Spirit, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, we're preaching this morning for um, some maybe not so familiar uh, uh, passages in the Bible, but uh, it is about effective prayer. Now, the best I, I can get, and there were people that cried out to the Lord before this and after this, but this is the first time where wherever one of God's people was documented to have effective prayer. Now, we go through a lot of things in the modern day uh, that people write off to prayer where it's nothing more than vain repetitions. Mm -hmm. And the Bible warns us of that. Uh, lofty prayer that, that prideth you up is never good. Prayer is to be humble and prayer is to be effective. Now, with that said, let me say most of us believe effective prayer is getting what you want. But that is not effective prayer. Effective prayer is when you can get up and know the surety that you've gotten a hold of God. And if you don't know what even I'm talking about, you've never had effective prayer. And so I want you to see that in this situation, there were a lot of contributing factors. Now, I will, and this is completely uh, as an aside, because, but I see this heresy not necessarily growing in the Lord's churches, but it's in abundance in false churches, that there was uh, uh, that um, the serpent and Eve had a child. I do not believe that. And that Cain married another woman and had uh, and asked where all these things come from. And they actually give the woman a name. I can't remember what it was. Eric and I were talking about it one day. But listen, all that is trash. Yeah. That are 
The story of creation is exactly what it is. Who Amen. did Cain marry? Who did Cain marry? He married his sister. I don't know which one I'm went astray, but that's who he married. And, and, and here in the modern day, we find the very same thing. Even in Abraham's day, they were still marrying their sister. Their half-sister, yes, but uh, and you know why that worked then and it don't work today? It's because they were closer to creation. They were closer to per being perfect. And, and so that's why, that, that's just an aside, and you can use that the next time, say, try to give you that big lofty question, you can say, well, he married his sister. And that will shut them up. And so we find that even in this time, it was still going on. Now, as we think about effective prayer, the only person that can answer about your prayer life is you. Uh, I can't look and, you know, sometimes if someone makes big lofty words and long speeches, uh, uh, they think that's effective prayer, or maybe you even think that it's effective prayer, but it doesn't mean that it is. And I know each and every one of you probably have had this situation growing up, and he's gone on to be with the Lord now, but there was a, a brother in the church I grew up with named Jim Payne. And when he was called on to to pray, everybody just sat down because we knew it was going to be a long one. And 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 so we see, and I don't know if Jim got a hold of God or not, uh, but I do know this, his prayer was lofty. And that's not necessarily effective prayer. Might be, but Lord help me, Jesus can be just as effective as a lofty prayer. So we find that situation, and the only thing I can come to, and we'll see a dream that Abimelech had concerning this, but somehow he knew that Abraham could have intercessory prayer. Now we also find another thing, and uh, don't get me wrong, I don't believe God has ever changed his mind. But I do believe the intercessory prayer. I, I believe he's very well pleased when someone's sick that you go with them in prayer. I believe he's very well pleased when you pray for your children that the Lord might save them and, and, and give them newness of heart. That's a very, uh, we need to be effective in prayer. And, and so why we really are looking at this is because I want you to measure your own prayer life and see if you can come to the conclusion that you have had effective prayer. Now, uh, chapter 20, the first verse, the Bible says this, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerah. Now, I want you to know uh, another thing. Uh, to get the context, you can sometimes go back to the next chapter, but not the case here because Genesis 19 is about the era of Lot and, and having children by his own daughters. And then, But the chapter before that is really you can pick up the story of Abraham and what had happened is he had just met with God. He had just met with the Almighty in all three persons and got the outline of the rest of his days from talking to God. And if you remember, uh, Sarah was in, in the tent and he asked and said, wherefore did Sarah laugh? That's the, that's the situation that they had just got out of. They had met with God. They had the plan of God for their lives. And they were heading out to do it. Now that's a wonderful, glorious thing, but we see immediately Satan arrives on the scene. Mm -hmm. Anytime when God has given you a determination to go in ministry, you look out, Satan's going to show up. He's going to hinder you. He's going to discourage you. He's going to uh, do anything that he possibly can. And a lot of people say, well, why don't Satan know that? Well, the reason is, he is blinded from the things of God. He still thinks he might win. So we, uh, so he certainly will come out against you, and he did Abraham here. Verse 2, And Abraham, uh, and Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. Now I want you to see... Uh, 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 a half-truth is still a lie. 
Right? Now, was he being honest when she he said, I'm married, uh, she's my sister? Yeah, but she had two roles. She was also his wife. See, we need to all, and, and we'll see the very reason he did it was self-preservation. See, we do a lot simply because of self-preservation. And not just eating and not just living. We do it to preserve character. We do, uh, we do it to preserve, uh, preserve a, a state, you know, a state in the community that we, we perceive ourselves to have. Many, many, many things that we do along the same lines. And so self-preservation will always interfere with your, with your service to the Lord. Um, we're to be yielded that if we give our life, we give it. And if he takes our life, he takes it. And that's a very, that's a very difficult thing to come to. Why? Because we value life. We want our life to be full of things and days and numbers and never given completely really to God. And, and so we find that this self-preservation that Abraham had got him into trouble. Verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now I want you to notice two things. That, uh, first of all, God intervened on Abimelech's part. And then secondly, God recognized the marriage. You know, uh, when Paul was writing, I think, to the church at Corinth, or maybe in Philippi, uh, but he says, the reason that he says the husband of one wife is because he recognizes every marriage that a person ever has. When my dad died, Mama and Wanda were still both living. Best I can see from the Word of God, he had two wives. He had Mama and he had Wanda. Because you know what? God recognizes every one of them at the woman at the well. He says, yeah, you have five husbands and the one that you are with now is not your husband and that you have well said. And uh, that's why the qualifications of the bishop are given like they are is because God recognizes the marriage. He, he recognizes every one of them. And so I want you to see here that he recognized that marriage. Now you can follow all the days of, of Abraham and there was never this big grand ceremony that we are documented in the word of God anyway, but God recognized their marriage. He recognized their union. And he made Abimelech accountable. Now, another thing I want you to notice about this is Abimelech was, was accountable even in his ignorance. Mm -hmm. What about the little children in Africa? All I can tell you is that they're accountable. I'm not going to give a grand dissertation on that. I take it by faith uh, that they're accountable. People that's never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be missionary. I would just be like the primitive Baptist. We could move the piano out and sit here and wait for the church to die. But, you know, uh, uh, that's not what we ought to be. And so I want you to see, uh, even though Abimelech was ignorant, he was held accountable. He was held accountable. And uh, dear friend, the lost people that you know, and you want them, you want their eyes to be open, you want their spiritual heart to be pricked, but they don't see it, and they don't see it, and they never see it, and they're pushing up daisies somewhere. I'm telling you, dear friend, they're still accountable. They're still accountable. And so we find that with Abimelech's situation. Then he says, but Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she's my sister? And she even, she herself, he is my brother in the integrity of my heart and the innocency of my hands. Have I done this? Now, I want you to also see that uh, Abimelech was, uh, <laughs> he claimed ignorance. You know, a lot of people in the last day, in the final judgment, 
of the of the damned. He said, they would say, did I not prophesy or preach in your name? And he would say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You know, me and Don used to talk about this uh, specific individual, and I won't use him because he's still living. But he ran a group here in Dover. I would not <laughs> even justify it as saying a church. He ran a group. And we were talking about him one night, and it was before we ever went to the West Tennessee, so it was a long time ago. And she says, uh, Larry, I wonder if at night he's almost demonic. And I said, no, Donna, he thinks he's doing right. He's blinded. He's ignorant. He doesn't know that the, the God of the heaven. He knows a God that he's created, but he doesn't know the God of the heavens. And so we find then that this ignorance plea is not justified by for God. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst uh, in the integrity of thine heart, but I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I not, uh, I suffered thee not to touch her. In other words, the marriage was not consummated. And in verse 7, Now therefore restore this man his wife, for he is a prophet. Now, you know, this gets down to divine election. Even when we don't deserve it, God protects us. <laughs> Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Man, Jacob was just a crook. He was just a deceiver. He was just a liar. If you look at him, at least in the world standard, Esau was the better man. But he elected, he elected Jacob. And the very same thing here, you know, ladies, why, you know, in nothing else, Abraham, when they came to take Sarah in to be uh, the king's wife, I had to say, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, she's my half sister, but she's almost, she's also my wife. That's intercessory. You see what I'm saying? He didn't even do that. Abraham was not this big, lofty, wonderful creature. He was a sinner saved by grace. And God used it. And so he says, uh, take his wife back to him. He's a preacher. He's a prophet. And, he, and he's going to be used with the Lord. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. Now, uh, very interesting there is we find a character of Abraham that he is prayerful. He says, this man's going to intercede on your behalf. Uh, again, in your King James Version, this is the first time you'll hear the word prayer or praying used. Uh, in some of the other scriptures, it'll say they cried out unto the Lord, especially when you get in the book of Exodus. But you know, Lord, help me. These people are killing me. Is that a prayer? Or is it just asking for help? Effective prayer is not going to him when the gig is up. Effective prayer is not going to him when you're having a little bit of problems and the money's not stretching quite far enough. That's not effectual prayer. Effectual prayer is when you go before God and when you get up, you know you've heard from that's, that's effective prayer. And I dare say in the modern day, very little of what we do is really effective. And I'm not saying uh, measure it by results. Measure, it, measure about what, if you know you've got a hold of God or not. And if you know what I'm talking about, you do. And just as surely as you do, you know when you have it. You know when it's just been empty and dry and you've not gotten a hold of anything. And so uh, he says, he's going to pray for you. He's going to intervene on your behalf. Know thou not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Notice the judgment. And if thou restore her not, know thou uh, that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Verse 8, Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and told all these things in their ears. 
and the men were so afraid. Now, I want you to notice the nature of Abimelech and his people that they were fearful of the judgment of God. You know what? We live in a day where that is just thrown away, thrown out the window. Now, back when uh, back when uh, Donna and I were in high school in the 80s, I will never forget this. She probably has. Uh, uh, Charles Lee taught our biology class. It was general biology. Very, very nice man. And we got on the subject of creation. And he had a picture of a cell. He always had it up there, like this map. It, was, it wasn't something grown, it was something that he bought. And I remember him saying, You can believe that that happened by accident. He says, But that's that's a that's a uh, such an organized system. How did it just pop up out of nowhere? Now today he lost his job for the very same thing. But I want you to see, at that time, people knew there was a God. And not only did they know that he, there was a God, they were fearful of him. That's gone, people. People don't fear God anymore. Remember a few years ago, and those of you, uh, probably about Jared's age, uh, those t-shirts everybody had no fear. You remember that when that came out? You know what? That was a stamp showing what day we lived. And uh, you know what? All I can say is that they, they, they probably it, that those words were probably exactly what was in their heart. Because they didn't know God and they didn't know to fear God. And, you know, uh, there's a lot that goes on all through the kings, it says, and there rose up a, new, a generation that knew not God. We're here. And, and, and so we find as <clears throat> uh, Abimelech <laughs> is fearful of the judgment of God. Verse 9 Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto them, What, what hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee, that thou brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? He knew that it was sinful. The, <laughs> thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. Again, the no fear, and he probably was right. I'll say this, you can't fear God till you know him. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed, she is my sister. We like to explain sin away, don't we? She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Well, uh, as you know, I kind of like genealogy. And what that really is, is a half-sister. She's a half-sister to him. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. Now, I want you to notice one thing here. Caused me to wander. Well, he called. <laughs> That's pretty belittling to the plan of God. The Bible says when he left that he called him out to the land of Ur of the Chaldees, right? It didn't say that he caused him to do it. It said that he called him out. See, we need to understand and know that whatever the circumstances we end up in, um, when we're in sin, it's our fault. Uh, that's accountability. That's saying, yes, I've done wrong. And so he was trying almost to blame God for the sin that had become in his life. Uh, and it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou wilt shew unto me at every place, whether we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and woman servants and gave them to Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And to Sarah he said, Behold, I give thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering to the eye of, the eye of, of the eyes. Now let me just emphasize, he is your covering not the other way around. You know, uh, you, know who, you know who's responsible for these three right here? 
It's not Donna, it's me. Uh, she does some midwifery work. If she stopped tomorrow, we would still be okay. And that's because I'm the provider, not her. You see what I'm saying? And, and that is how it's to be done. And, and, and so we find the very same thing. It says this man is going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. Behold, he is, the, he is to the covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with, and with all other. Thus she was reproved or corrected and they both were accountable. So Abraham prayed unto God and God healed it of Abimelech. Now, one thing that if you're not careful, I don't know when this disease came on him. God said that it was a judgment and it was going to happen. And by this point, it had already happened. Uh, again, ignorance was no excuse, was it? You know why people will be cast into hell? It's because, <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I never heard of Jesus. Too bad and I'm sad. He's not going to take that as an excuse. You know what the Bible says concerning that? Even the heavens declare His glory. Look up, you know, if you've been seeing these red moons the last few nights, uh, they're just majestic. They declare the glory of the Creator. And ignorance is no excuse. And, and so we find then the very same thing here uh, that the judgment came even though Abimelech did not, did not perceive himself as accountable. Listen, friend, you're accountable. Do not use ignorance is bliss. It will not work. And, and so we find that uh, he did do this, and whatever, uh, whatever Abraham prayed, and I will notice that uh, I will have you notice it is not documented what he said. If he said anything, it just said that uh, Abraham prayed, and God freed them up. God, God took the disease. You, uh, you know, uh, whenever we be go before God in prayer. Uh, the very first element you need to take down there with you is humbleness. Uh, remember when they would go into the temple? To even enter the temple, they had to offer a sacrifice. Isn't it a wonderful thing that we don't have to do that anymore? That the Lord Jesus Christ is our sacrifice, and we can go before Him in prayer, whether we're here or whether we're in our homes or whether we're in our pickup on the way to work, wherever we may be, that we can go before the throne. Remember the prayer of the publican. Lord, I, uh, he just went like this and said, Lord, help me. Uh, uh, I mean, not the publican. Yeah, the publican. Yeah. But remember the Pharisee? Lord, I think I'm not even as this one. I'm a Jew among Jews. You know what? From the very moment he came that way, his prayer became ineffective. You know, it's a good thing. It's a blessed thing. And I will go even further because a lot of people don't understand this. It's a gift to be in one of the Lord's true churches. But you know what? I crave effective prayer even more than that. Just being able to get a hold of God. Mm -hmm. And when I get up, I understand and know that I have. Mm -hmm. You know what? All, whatever transpired, it could have been just Abraham pouring out his heart silently. We have no documentation whatsoever what was said or what was done. It's just that he prayed and God brought results. You hear that whole that whole bunch of people. See, we need to be like that, do we not? We need to be the kind of people that are known for effectual prayer. And the Lord is very well pleased with that. Go me to Deuteronomy chapter nine. Deuteronomy chapter nine. Uh, Moses' time as leader is very much drawn to a quick conclusion. And he would soon be home of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 16. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God. Now I want you to notice that this is a, 
a very much a declarative statement, and Moses wasn't afraid to make it. He's referring way back to the days of the molten calf when he went up to get on, on the mountain to get the law, and he came back, and Aaron and his bunch had done what they did. And, and, and he was referring back to that, and uh, he, he didn't cut no beans about it. He said they got a molten calf, they were sinful, they were idolatrous, you know what? We need to be the very same way. Now, we don't have to be critical, but you know what? Sodomy is a sin in the nostrils of God. And we don't need to cut it any other way. Now, do you have to go punch a sodomite in the mouth and say you're, you're sticking sin in the nostril of God? No. When you preach it, tell it like it is. And you know what? This will be the hardest thing you do. Then begin effectual prayer for that person. Mm -hmm. That's hard, is it not? I mean, it, it's a disgust to me. It really is. It makes me sick to my stomach. But could I not pray for them? Could I not intervene on their behalf? And that's just one sin. What about drugs? Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes it's very hard to pray for a drug addict when you know they're, they're just draining old people for what little money that they have and all the time just sticking it up their nose. You know what? It's hard to pray for people like that. But we're supposed to. Amen. And, and so I want you to see this intercessory type prayer that uh, Moses has really is amazing to me because I know that me as myself would not have been nearly as interventive as Moses was. And I looked and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God and made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. You know, I've often wondered, and I believe as I was studying, the Lord showed me this, why did Abraham do that? I mean, excuse me, why did Moses do that? Was he just angry? No. It was, it's a very much a symbol of cutting out your communication to God. When we openly sin, don't, don't think you're going to hear from God because you're not. And those blessed tablets, he got the, he got the second set, you know, all right? You're not going to hear from him anymore. And he broke them right in front of the whole, the whole crowd. And then, as always, they paid, they played past the buck. Uh, verse 17. Verse 18, I'm sorry. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first. Forty days and forty nights did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now, I'll give you some insight on that and, and you, you know, you take this for what it's worth. Um, juice fast are fine. And I've seen a lot of people do those. It's nothing the word of God against them. Uh, we need nourishment, you know. Uh, genetically, uh, 40, 40 day fast, strict 40 day fast from food is not even possible. You're going to die. So, why was he able to do that? Even further, he said, I didn't drink water. You know how much, you know how long in man's eyes and my nursing training tells me you can live without liquid seven days and you're going to be dead. How was he sustained? Well, he was sustained by the Almighty. I believe he didn't have a crumble of bread. I don't believe he had one seed of fruit. I don't believe he had nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. And he was an intercessor in prayer. You know, I fully believe if he hadn't done this, God would have taken the whole pile out. He would have been just and right in doing it. Mary and Abram were nothing but a, a hindrance to Moses. Just would he have been if he'd opened it, the earth had opened its mouth and swallowed every one of them. But just as surely just would he have been if he did that to me. Right? 
separate and apart from the blood of Christ, the very same thing would happen to me. And so we find this amazing man of prayer that, that did what would seem to the world impossible and did a 40-day fast on their behalf. Verse 19, why? For I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure wherewith, wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. Now, uh, did God know what he was going to do? Yeah. Did Moses know what he was going to do? No. You know what? When you stand in the in ignorance of the will of God, the very best thing you can do is get on your knees. Don't get on your knees and begin to cry out. Don't ever use the sovereignty of God as an excuse not for intercessory prayer. You know what? As sovereign grace Baptists, I believe we've gotten down to that. Well, uh, uh, brother, uh, brother Dan used to pay, call it K Sarah Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. No, no, that, uh, he's very well pleased with intercessory prayer. What's your problem? Now, there's not one of us this morning that don't have issues. Take it before the Lord. Be that intercessor. You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about my niece ever since the funeral yesterday. And with all her problems, I've been trying to lift her up to the Lord. Because you know what? That's a horrific event for someone that knows the Lord. But could, could you imagine not having anything to rely on? Your parents, your grandmother, and now your baby is gone. You know what? That would I would feel pretty lonely, wouldn't you? And so, could I criticize my niece? Sure. <laughs> and I have. Shame on me. But you know what would work better for that girl? Just pour it out right before the Lord. Because you know what? I don't know what God might do. She may be here next Sunday running the house. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? In man's eyes, we doubt it's possible. But in, God, in God's eyes, we just don't know, do we? We need to be intercessors. We need, we need to have effectual prayer. And, and, and not too good to pray for people and, and intervene on their behalf. Verse uh, 20, And the Lord was very angry with Aaron uh, to, the, to have destroyed him, and I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. So he's praying for national Israel, and God held Aaron uh, accountable specifically for the idolatry. He wanted to take Aaron out, and, and he went and he interceded on Aaron's behalf too, even when Aaron was in rebellion. So you know what? When you see somebody going down the wrong course, when you see one of God's men headed out in a worldly direction, don't you criticize, don't you be the one that says, well, I knew it would never last. You intercede on their behalf and be a very effectual in your prayer. Because again, you may think you do, but you just don't know. And, and, and so we find, and, and we know certainly that Aaron was restored. And why? Because effective prayer. Verse 22. And at Tibera and at Massa, and he, you provoke the Lord to wrath. Likewise, uh, when uh, the Lord has sent you to Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have gotten you. Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you believed him not, and nor hearkened to his voice. Now, I want you to see he refers to this instance at Kadesh Barnea, where they could have started occupying the land, even in the rulership of Moses. And, and what did it say? You believe not. And you know what? When you don't believe, it impacts your actions. He says, you believe not and would not go up. You know, I, I'm to the point now, if they don't come to church, you can't make them. Right. Let it go. Let it go. 
And, and, and so we find in the very same way, now should we be mad and angry? No, no, we should enter. You know, the drive that sends people to church is given of God. It's not something you work up in the flesh. That, that's as much as a gift of God of salvation itself because uh, it's not in us to do that. And so we see that he again intervened on their behalf. Verse 24, you've been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. And thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights and I fell down as I fell down at the first because the Lord had said, he would destroy you. So we had the situation with the belt rebellion with Aaron, and then you have this situation of rebellion some probably 20 years later, and we still have an intercessor. We still have someone that was praying. M Moses went to it again. You know, after that, I believe, you know what? I'm sick of y'all. And, you know, God did whatever you want to with them, right? And, but that wasn't Moses. You know, that's not the character of a saved person, is it? It really isn't. Now, can we get in the flesh and have that character? You betcha. But it's not spiritual and it's not of the Lord. Right. Uh, we need to be the intercessor. We're in a horrible day. How many of y'all prayed for Nancy Pelosi this week? I didn't. <laughs> what about our president? You know, he's almost good. We need to pray for that man. He's in a mess, y'all. It, it truly is sad. It truly is. What about when our vice president becomes president. You gonna pray for her? She's out of her place, is she not? Does that exempt her from your prayers? It does not. So when Kamala gets there, you pray for her. Can you praise the psalmist? Let, her, let his days be few and let his office another man take. <laughs> Guess we could do that, could we not? Yeah. I prayed for that when President Obama was the president. <laughs> but it's still an accessory prayer, is it not? And even that's funny, but even with that, be compassionate about it. She's out of her place. You know? That puts her in a situation under the judgment of God, even right then. Right? Are you glad about the judgment of God? Moses certainly wasn't. And man, he had more of a right to be than any of us. And still we find 40 days of intercessory prayer, not once, but twice. We need that today, do we not? We live in a very wicked, wicked generation, do we not? If you don't believe that, just look around. At work sometime, I just shake my head and stand in amazement. How so many girls come there dressed for work. I thought, you know, these nose rings. I thought about Miss Buttermore ripping it out for them. Right? But that's that, that that's that's the norm. You know what? Instead of thinking about Miss Buttermore ripping it out for them, I need to go into intervention prayer, do I not? But that's hard to do. Very hard to do, is it not? But it is what we're supposed to do. So the next time you have one that rubs you the wrong way, you're like, I'm so sick of you. And you know, the last few months has taught me this. And my boss used to be boss at work. I don't care if she, she's not down low, but if she does, more power to her. Maybe she'll say something that'll help her. I got to where I couldn't pray for her. And then that affects me spiritually. Mm -hmm. It's already cut off from her, and it's come to me. Right? Mm -hmm. We use anger and maltreatment as a lot of spiritual excuses, do we not? 
when you just go before him in prayer, whoever it is. Difficult boss, difficult children, whatever your situation is. Go before pour it out. Our leaders, our local leaders. We need to pray for them. And uh, you know, if we do that in sincerity, our hands are clean. Everybody on. How's your prayer life? Can you be an intercessor when your prayer is so so? Can you be an intercessor without fasting? I really don't think you can be. Because see that sets the flesh aside, does it not? That's the purpose of fasting. To put the spirit man first and the carnal man second. What about you?